pray that you'd have your way in Jesus' name. Every word that you want spoken, let it be spoken. Nothing more and nothing less in Jesus' name. Let me not babble, Lord. Let's go straight to the point. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 4. I am going to be reading pretty much the whole of this chapter, talking as we go along the way, okay? So here we go. But it so happened when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indigenous and mocked the Jews. Now the walls needed to be rebuilt. So many of you will know the story. If you don't, I don't want to go into all the context behind because we're pulling it into our context today. And God's going to speak, if you like, out of context with a rhema word. Rhema word just means literally a spoken word right for you right now. So verse 2, And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Now that's the enemy coming against us as a church. So as we see LBC being built, I'm getting all these things said to us about it's going to fall down, it won't stand. And so I'm praying, saying, God, what's the best that can happen? And then the other side is, what's the worst that can happen? And when I ask what's the worst that can happen, the worst that can happen is LBC here, right here in England, collapses. That's the worst that can happen. But what has happened? We planted churches all around the world and they will continue to go. Because they continue to have churches in these countries before we got involved. We've just enabled them to have buildings. We've enabled them to have extra support. We've enabled them to go further. And so that's the best that can happen. Or should I say that's the worst that would happen. That's the worst that would happen. Is, so what? We'd all have to go and join another church. And I'd have to work in Tesco's. Not that if everyone with Tesco's, if anyone works in Tesco's, I'm just saying I need to go and get a new job. I need to go and get a new job. I've said too many in, uh, politically incorrect things now, and they're all online for me to go back into a school. So I'm not getting back into school. So Tesco's is the way forward for me. Or Asda. But just to throw out to Asda and Tesco's right there, that'd be 10%, please. And so, church, I want you to be aware the enemy is attacking us as a church. You heard from Rio. From our church in Rio, there was a bit of a split there. Like, I don't want to go too deep into it, but someone very important in the church, they're one of the worship leaders, has pull, pulled away, had a, had a big bust up with the pastor, the pastor Vinicius, and um, accused him of many things, and then spat loads of stuff about LBC that were from the Masons, like Masonic. Now, we're definitely not that. And the reasoning was, over the last six months, the church has grown so quick, so big, so, so quickly, this doesn't happen normally. No, it, it probably doesn't happen normally. But when God says, I'm putting my hand on that thing, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so that's not by our power or by our minds, but that's by the Spirit. That, that's by God. And so if God comes and places his hand on your life right now, he can do anything. He can do anything. If you need a miracle from heaven right now, I promise you, you let God put his hand on your life. There may be work for you to do, as we're going to find out in a moment. There was still work for the Jews here when the enemy came attacking them. But think about it as, think of us in this context. Think of us as the Jews. Think of us as the people rebuilding the walls. And the enemy is coming at us. Okay? That's the word, that's the way God gave it to me. In verse 6, <clears throat> in verse 6, it says, So we built the wall and the entire wall and we joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work is so key, church. We need a mind to work. Hence what I mentioned about youth, about kids' workers, about cleaners. 
We need a mind to work. We can't just keep coming in here and getting constipated. What do I mean? You get constipated on the words. You just fill up, fill up, fill up. You never give out. You need to let some out. You, you, you understand? You can't just get full with it and never give out. You're getting constipated, church. I don't want a constipated church. Jesus doesn't want a constipated church. We become Pharisees. I know. Let's get off constipated. Everyone's like, get constipated. Anyone got some laxity? Anyway, we gotta we gotta give out church. As it comes in, be like a sponge. Be like a sponge. You stick a sponge in the water, it soaks it up. Then just squeeze yourself all the summer. Or squeeze yourself over a a, a job, a role. Just squeeze yourself and say, Jesus, all for you. Amen. You don't do it for the pastor. You, you don't do it to look good. You, you don't do it to give yourself a name. You don't do it to promote yourself. You do it for Jesus. Amen. He's the one that died on a cross for you. He's the one that rose again. He's the one we're going to stand before. And it's not by good works that you're saved. But we are saved for good works. We are saved for good works. I want to show the world that I belong to Jesus. Amen. Well, if I can't even work for my Savior, my King died for me. If I can't give my life for Him, time is short. Time is short. Let's deal with the things in our lives and let's get on with serving God. Let's get on with serving God. For the people had a mind to work. Church, have a mind to work. A mind to work because the enemy is coming at us. Verse 7 to verse 9. It says, Now it happened when Sambada, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps <clears throat> were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. I'll tell you why that is. Church, again, our context. When you close the gaps, Unity is growing. I remember a word in um, a prayer evening one night. I think it was Lisa gave it. And she had this picture of us all holding like, arms. We were linking arms over and over it was. And as we like, we went in, the gaps just closed. The gaps just closed. I'm reminded now, just as I said that, as we linked arms and we moved in together, the gaps closed. You can't get in. You, you, you can't get in. The enemy wants to weigh in. The enemy, I, I said it very briefly yesterday, the enemy, he means divider. He means someone that would split. He's a deceiver, he's cunning, he knows what he's doing. He just wants to worm his way in. He wants to worm his way in, bring disunity into the church. He wants to worm his way into your lives as well. Because as we speak about the church right now, you may need an individual message. And this goes right into an individual message as well. The enemy wants to worm his way into your life. If you leave gaps for him, he's going to step in. You need to close those gaps. If you leave gaps for him, he will step in. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Because if you do, you will leave a landing patch. You will leave a stronghold. The enemy will just step in and create a stronghold in your life. That's why you should deal with things straight away. You shouldn't leave time. It says if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, you should go to them. Why? Because if you don't, something grows inside of you. You can blame them all you like, but something grows inside of you and the enemy just steps in. Starts to create a stronghold, starts to spread a cancer. The enemy wants to get into the center of the church to bring us down. The enemy wants to get into the center of your life to bring you down. Keep your eyes open, church. In verse 8 it says, And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. That right there, verse 9, for me, when I read that, I felt God say that was just faith and action working together. That right there is what the church should be. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God. We pray. We pray first and foremost, but then what did they do? They didn't sit back and say, we prayed, over to you God. And because of them, we set watch against them day and night. They prayed, and then they went into action. They prayed, 
and then they went into action. Later on, we're going to find out that they got a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. They work with one hand and they got a weapon ready to fight in the other. Now, we know that we don't fight with the weapons of this world. And if we have the time and we get there, we'll be going into Ephesians, we'll go into the book of Daniel. I don't think we're going to get through it all. But church, keep your eyes on Jesus. Church, be aware as LBC is growing, as this church is growing, God has put his hand on this church. Yes. I, I don't need to say to uh, you can see it. It's not because of me. It's not because of anybody else. God has come and placed his hand on this church. Amen. Now, he would have gone and said, who can I use? Who can I use? And he would have found probably me on my floor in my office saying, use me, God, use me. And probably many of you have been on the floor saying, use me, use me. And maybe enough of us cried out, use me. And God said, I'm going to use this church. Or maybe he looked at us and said, what a foolish looking church. Let me use them lot because only I can receive the glory. Amen. I don't know which way it was. All I know is that God receives the glory. It's his steps. Our heart can desire whatever it wants, but it's him that moves us. It's him. It's his steps. And I just want to stay close to God. I want to be <coughs> foolish. I, I want to be weak. I never want to come out of that place because when I'm in that place, I know God can use me. I never want to become proud. I, I never want to think I've got this all together. One, because I've never got it all together. And I certainly don't have it all together now. None of us will have our lives all together. Church, the enemy wants to bring you down as an individual and he wants to bring this church down. But we can't allow that to happen. The next, next verse, Bernie. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. How many times have we been through seasons like that when we're like, we're just failing, our strength's going. Church, revive yourself. The psalmist says, revive again. Be revived, oh church, again. Be revived, be revived. We gotta revive ourselves. How? If you do not pick up the word of God, how are you filling yourself up? If you do not worship God, how are you filling yourself up? If you do not spend time with him, how are you filling yourself up? There are practical things to do, church. You have to do them. You, you cannot be this person that just expects to turn up to church, have 40 minute sermon, a, a couple of songs, and that's the end of it. You have to pick up the word of God. You have to worship God. You have to have your own relationship. The Bible says when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? He's looking at individuals. He's looking, will he find faith in Charlie's life? Will he find faith in Haley's life? Charlie's faith doesn't rescue Haley, and Haley's faith doesn't rescue Charlie. They're individuals. They're individuals. Will he find faith on the earth? Church, he hates us with a passion, the enemy does. But God loves us so much. So much. The strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said they wouldn't even know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times from whatever place you turn that they will be upon us. Verse 13 and 14. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. See, the church responded. The church must get on the attack. The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. Forcefully advancing. As a church, we must forcefully advance. We don't retreat. We step forward, get into positions, Okay, get the youth team together, get the kids workers together, get the cleaners together, get the speakers together, get the traveling people together, get the worship team together, get the food people together, the tea people together. Everyone get in position, get into position, get ready, get ready because when the enemy comes, he wants to start knocking people down, he wants to isolate people. If you isolate yourself, if you isolate yourself, the enemy will take you off. 
He will knock you down. Remember the coals. Remember them. When they're all together, red hot, the coals in a barbecue, they're all on fire. Pick one up, put it on the side, you isolated it. What happens? It loses its red ember. It loses its hotness. It goes cool, black as charcoal. It stops the heat. Pick it back up, put it in the fire. It starts again. We've got to be together, church. You need me as much as I need you. You need Helen as much as Helen needs you. Luke needs you as much as you need Luke. And we can go around the whole room. There is not one person in this room that we don't need. Each part of the body is needed. And those that think they're, they're less, they're actually irreplaceable, if you like. They are so needed. They are so needed. God speaks so highly of those places. Verse 14, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Let's fight for each other, church. Let's fight. Then let's fight for one another. Then let's, let's not be so Christian. Hear me right. Hear me right. Let's not be so Christian that we can't stand up and fight. We need to fight, church. We need to fight for one another. Luke, would you just go to them? We need to fight for one another, church. We've we, we got to be on this. Me and you together. We've we got to be together, church. I need you. You need me. If we've got something going on over here, I want my brother or my sister to be able to step forward and come right alongside and say, I've got you. I've got you. If you're struggling over there, I want to be a man that comes over here and say, I've got you. I've got you. I'm standing with you. You see, Aaron and her, remember Moses. Remember Moses. When his arms fell, the Israelites started to lose. But when Aaron and Hur got under his, his arms, they would lift his arms up and the Israelites would win. Yes, if you know the story, you know it was like a physical act with a real spiritual meaning. It's no different to the church today. The, the physical act is when we, when we pray, but there's such a spiritual meaning. If ever, if ever you've, you've needed a touch from heaven, if ever you've needed something, Something to change your life. If ever you've needed something to come in and change it all, then I'm telling you, when you pray, when you look to heaven, there, there's a chance. And you can say, no, no, I've tried this before. But I, I know what it was when I was an addict. I know what it was to not know Jesus. I know what it was to have nothing. I know what it was to want to commit suicide. I know what it was. And then I looked up to heaven and I said, heaven... I'm so far down in the good act. I've tried everything. Let me try you. I've got nothing else to live for. And I promise you, I promise you, you may say, I've got nothing else to live for. This doesn't work. It doesn't work. Nothing works. But I promise you, try my Jesus. Try my Jesus. When you try him, the Bible says, when you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. I promise you, he won't let you down. If that's the only thing you go home with today, if that's the only thing you take out of this place today, I want you to know, try Jesus. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, that every addiction on your life in Jesus' name will be broken. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, that you will touch that life in Jesus' name. That you would not allow the enemy to take them any deeper. That you would not allow the enemy to take them further down. The Lord, you didn't place them in this place today by mistake. You didn't bring them here by mistake. You brought them here because you want to break the chain. But you brought them here because you want to do something new in their life. You brought them here because there is a new way. And they can fight it all their life. But Jesus, I know that you're real. Jesus, I know that you can change their life. Jesus, I know that you can give them a hope for the future. Lord, I pray, soften their hearts today. Holy Spirit, I ask in the name of Jesus, as your word says, if you hear his voice today, do not harden your heart, my brother. Do not harden your heart. Verse 14, it says, fight. 
Fight for your people. Fight for the church. Fight for one another. Let's stand together, church. Let's stand as one. Verse 15. Verse 15. This is brilliant. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us. And that God had brought their plot to nothing. That all of us returned to the wall. Everyone to his work. You know what happens? When you bring it into the light. The enemy loses his hold on you. When you bring it into the light. The enemy loses his hold on you. He can no longer. No longer have that power. No longer have that grip. You've got to make that next step, church. You've got to make that next step, church. When he brings it into the light, the enemy will go after your life so much. He wants to pull you so far away from God. He wants to, let's be honest, there's heaven and there's hell. There's no middle ground. And he wants to take as many people to hell as possible. But Jesus says, no, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Let not there be a distraction. Let not anyone distract you right now, church. You need to know, you need to know when it's brought into the light, it loses its grip. It loses its grip. The enemy will lose his grip on your life. Hand it over to Jesus. Church, as we move forward in our context, we stay close to Jesus. The enemy has been coming at us from different angles. I believe it's been brought into the light. I believe that that way it's going to start to lose its grip. You watch us go again. You watch us go again. Nick gave a word about consolidation. I don't think the consolidation will be too long. I don't think we'll be consolidating what we have for like months and months and months. I think as the grip of the enemy loses its strength, I think you watch this. You watch us go. You, you watch us go. I, I don't believe that we're going to just stand still now. That, that's not what we do. We are forcefully advancing. Amen. We are forcefully advancing. And we will advance, church. We will advance. It happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us. And that God had brought their plot to nothing. That all of us returned to the wall. Everyone to his work. When I was an addict, I walked into a church one day. I walked into a church as an addict. I had nothing else to live for after my daughter had died. I didn't want to live. I had nothing. I walked into a church. What happened that day is I brought my problems into the light because I met the light. And when I met the light, when I met Jesus, the enemy lost his grip on me. It was just one act, one moment of walking into a church. And from that moment, I responded, I want your Jesus. I want what you've got. I want to know this Jesus that you talk about. I need to exchange my old life for a new life. And I found him to be the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 16, don't mind me going in and out of the gospel and I into a word for the church. I'm sure you understand. Verse 16, so it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Church, as we move forward, as we move forward, we're going to be doing work. We're going to be working for the kingdom of God. But we've got to keep our weapons sharpened. And that's what we do at home. That's what we do with our day to day. That, that's what we do when we, we read the word of God. When we get into Bible meetings. When we get into the, the kingdom of God. When we get into the presence of God. We're sharpening. Sharpening our weapons. If we, if we take the next verse, Bernie, is it 19? That's what we're going to go to, 19. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. It just reminds me so much of the church, LBC. It's so great and extensive. It's so hard, the work is. And we can feel quite separated. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, we bring it to us there. God will fight for us. When we hear the trumpet sound, when we hear the call for prayer, we must come. We must come to pray. We must go to one knees and pray. Last week, we brought a prayer meeting together. Why? 
Because we had somebody in hospital from our congregation, and we had another one on the life support machine. What should the church have done? We should get our backsides here. We should get to our knees, because if you were on the life support machine, you would need us to get there. I would have heaven and hell to get to my knees. But I'm going to get in that place, and I'm going to pray, because they need me right now. That's the, we can speak a good game, but when it comes to it, do we do it? What happens, church? What happens when over the other side of the world, Rio is in terrible danger? Or what happens when the Burundi church is under attack? If we can't even come to our knees for one that's in our congregation, that we see week in, week out, how are we going to do it for those that we don't see? Church, it's so important. From the least to the most, everybody in this room, everybody in this room, it is so important we go to our knees together. Not just ones and twos, not here fight for us, or we know where and here go. No, I'm stronger when you're here. You'll be stronger when I'm here. Together we go, together we fight. That's how we fight our battles. Amen. That's how we fight our battles. When you hear the trumpet call, go to prayer, church. Go to prayer when you hear the trumpet call. I need everyone to understand the enemy is real. The spiritual warfare is real. Judges chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. This is the second time this word has been given to us as a church. It was given to us over in Albury a few years ago, and it's been given again. And I believe that's the season we've just been going through. Because I've seen so many people go to prayer. I've seen so many people start warring. Now these are the nations which the Lord left. That he might test Israel by them. That is all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war. At least those who had not formerly known it. Sometimes we go through things to teach us how to battle. The disciples said to Jesus, teach me how to pray. Sometimes we go through tough times and you think, why have I had to go through that? You've learned so much. You've learned so much. I think of Michael, it's amazing, it's great to see you. We know the news behind the scenes as God is really moving. We know that there's a battle still on. You just had a phone call, you spoke to your wife? Praise God. <laughs> We know the fight is real. We know what you've been going through. We can sympathize with some of the things you've been going through. We don't know everything, obviously, but we've been praying as a church. We've been battling as a church. We've been fasting as a church. And we've been waiting for a breakthrough. And when we see these breakthroughs happening, it doesn't just stop. We keep going. We, we keep going. And we know that this church has been under attack. We know that many people have learned how to war through this time. We've been warring for Lisa and for Reese. We've been warring for Chloe. We've been warring for Michael, his family. Church, we've been warring for many different things. Over in Rio de Janeiro, one of our leaders died over there, just suddenly died. Um, there's been a split there. There's been so much going on. Burundi, so much going on. If you knew the things behind the scene, you'd really understand the weight we've been carrying as a church. So when we say, let's get to our knees and pray for these individuals, you understand how much weight you take? Because that's one, that's one situation that you've joined in and you've bore the load. You've bore the load. Every single one of you has been amazing for this time. Every single one of you. We just thank God that he's taught us how to pray. We thank God that he puts someone in us that says, we're going to stand. That's hashtag gang mentality. Amen. That's sticking to the <laughs> Territory is what the devil wants, okay? The devil wants territory. He wants territory, he wants land, and he wants territory in your life. If you're an addict in the room today, it's not a surprise. The devil hates you with passion. He hates you with passion. He, he wants territory in your life. It's a stronghold. It's, 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 he's got you. Or he thinks he has. But in a moment, those chains can be broken. Or within a moment, those chains can be broken. And everyone will just straight away think of addicts as in drugs, alcohol. It could be something totally, it could be pornography. It, it, it could be anything. I, I could mention so many different things. There is no, this sin's worse than this sin. 
Sin is sin, and that's why we all need a saviour. That's why every single one of us needed a saviour. That's why not one of us is different. Nehemiah 4, 7, you see when the walls started to close, the gaps started to close. That's the best thing that can happen, church. When unity, when unity comes, when we stand together, when we link arms and we move forward together, we don't let room for the enemy to come in. The enemy wants to divide families. The enemy wants to divide this church family. The enemy wants to divide us. He wants to divide and conquer. He's after territory. He's after land. But we won't allow him to have it. We won't allow him to have it. Two years ago, I went through a tough season. And um, I went away for the night. And I stopped in the log cabin. It was just one of those like cabins out in the woods or out in the sticks. And there's no internet, no nothing. And um, I, I went there with all the intention, I'm going to pray all night long. Something was going on in, the, in my life, in the, in the church. I couldn't get a grasp on it. I've got all these voices coming to me. Everybody knows what's going on, but I don't. And all these voices are saying something different. Everybody's coming with a different thing. This is what's happening in the church. This is what's happening. You, you know, so, so, so many people knew, but heaven hadn't spoken to me. And I'm like, heaven, I need you to speak. Because right now, it's the description that's going on. Like we've just about touched every possibility. I need heaven to be direct. And so I, I went there to this log cabin. And by five o'clock in the afternoon, I, I got to my knees, put my head on the, the bed, fell straight asleep. <laughs> I was meant to pray all night. Three o'clock in the morning, I was woken up. Three o'clock in the morning, I was woken up. From a five o'clock, my knees went to the floor. Three o'clock in the morning, I was woken up. Jezebel, Jezebel, Jezebel. That's all I could hear. I dreamed about something called a Jezebel spirit. I never understood that. You need to understand the spiritual things are real. You, you have to understand that there's a good, there's an evil, there's a God, there's a the devil. And this whole word, Jezebel spirit, knew nothing about it. And so I just put a teaching on. I put a teaching on about it, a Jezebel spirit. Like, what is this? I, I'm not the type of person that will run after everything and see a devil in everything. Some people see demons in everything. That's not me. I don't see a demon in everything. I like to be more of the balance. I used to be, there's no demons. Like, oh, we're all right, we're, we're, we're blessed, we've got Jesus. He come broke everything, don't you worry about that. You worry about demons, I'm going to just keep praising Jesus. That used to be me. I'm here now. I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm like, my trust is in Jesus, I'm praising Jesus, but I understand that bit's real. But I think sometimes we can be all the way over here and we miss the, well, Jesus, you're over there, you set me free. And so finding the balance, I think is so needed. So needed. And so for me, I know the warfare is real. I know the devil's real. I've seen some of the things that he's done in people's lives. I've seen him manifest. I've seen so many things in this whole Jezebel thing. Whether I say the right wording or not, I just know what we went through as a church. I know what God showed me. And then I went to a men's breakfast a couple of days or so after. And the pastor there said, Aaron, I've got to tell you, um, the devil... God told me the devil's out to sift you. He's come to sift you as wheat. If you don't sort it out, you'll be out of ministry within a year. And I took it, I thought, Jezebel spirit, now that, something's going on in the church. What's going on? I was driving along. I'm still now searching and trying to understand what this whole spiritual stuff is. Without talking to people, I just want to hear heaven. Because everyone has an opinion. I just needed to hear heaven. I needed my Bible. I needed to read. And so as I was driving my car, I got a message. It was from a pastor that was over in America. And he said, Aaron, God's put you on my heart. What's the matter? I can't remember the whole story now. All I know is I, I think I'd said, um, I can't, did I say I need this person to follow me if it's, if this, I just need this person to phone me, Lord. And literally within about three or four minutes, this person phoned me. I, I, I trusted some of the things that he said. I, I trusted his spiritual understanding. I hadn't told him anything. I was just speaking to God and saying, I could really do with this guy to phone me right now. But he was out of the country. He was in America. Three or four minutes later, after me praying that prayer in my car, 
I was pulled up on a car park and this guy has told me, this pastor, he said, God told me to, to get in touch with you. What's going on? And he said, hold there. He said that you're under a spiritual attack. He said there's a controlling spirit that's trying to get into your church. Deal with it now or you'll be out of ministry within 12 months. I put them all together. I went back and I dealt with that controlling spirit. And the son would call a controlling spirit. Others would freely say Jezebel spirit. And don't think um, a Jezebel spirit is just connected to women. It's not. It, is, it can be connected to all. And so I went and dealt with this controlling spirit. And you, you don't stroke a, a spirit. If the person won't deal with what's going on, they both go. And that's what happened in this case. And we saw the church move. We saw the church move forward. Why? Because the spiritual world is so real. The spiritual realm is so real. It's so, so real. But let me bring the balance straight away. Go to John 21. John 21, you'll think, how are we going to find a balance here? You'll get it in a moment. It's a bit weird, but you'll get it. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went to have and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. They couldn't get no fish. Then Jesus said, put your net on the other side of the boat. So they put the net on the other side of the boat. Now they caught a whole lot of fish. Verse 10, they're on the beach now. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Who caught the fish? And that's what made me, who caught the fish? The disciples never caught the fish. Jesus caught the fish. Jesus said, put your net on the other side of the boat. The disciples tried all night to catch fish, but they couldn't catch fish. One word from the king changed everything. It was Jesus that caught the fish. And so the balance of all this is, we may see demons flee. We may see strongholds broken down. But if ever we think it's us, we stand in this balance. God used us to deal with that, but it was through him. It, it's Jesus that it takes place. All the time, the balance must always be, our eyes always go back to Jesus. It says, don't, don't rejoice that demons flee in, your, in my name. Don't rejoice that you can cast out demons, basically. But rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. And I learned that lesson very early on as well. The question never was, did people have faith? But the question was, where did that faith come from? That's the question today. Like this gift of faith, the things that we see happening. Where is it coming from? My faith is in Jesus. When Christ speaks, when God speaks, you know you can act. You know you can act. Because heaven has spoken. And so heaven spoke in that season about that spirit that was going on in the church that was dealt with. And now we come to a place in, in the church move now. And I can hear heaven again shouting. I can hear heaven again shouting about the spiritual things that are taking place. And, and I'm not jumping around saying this, this, and this. I'm holding things. Because the moment I say something out loud, the, the, if, it's not, if it's not a reality and it's not true, I look like a soft leader who doesn't know left from right. And so I have to hold things. But I, God is leading us in a certain direction. One thing I know is church. The attack's real. The, the enemy's real. And he will come and attack your life as well. And may, maybe you can see so many bad things happen in the world and you can see the devil in the world, but you can't see God in the world. Trust me, there's no devil without God. John 3, 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Heaven's our source. Jesus is our source. In, in Ephesians, I we're going to try and do just a few moments of Ephesians. In Ephesians, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now these words here, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. 
verse 12, where it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, is because the spiritual world is more real than the physical world. There's three heavens. The Bible speaks about three heavens. And I, I could give you scriptures to explain it more due to time. I'm going to really briefly go over it. Three heavens. You've got this heaven that the Bible speaks about. This is like our atmosphere. This is what we're in. This is where we breathe. The heavens gave rain. That's in James. The, the heavens gave rain. And then Abraham was sent out in Genesis to look up into the heavens and see the starry host. That would be like the second heaven. And the third heaven we know to be the glory of God, the throne room of God. You're not getting into the third heaven just yet. But the first heaven, the second heaven, it speaks about the heavens in the Bible. Somewhere in between the first heaven and the third heaven. That spiritual realm. There's a fight going on. There's a battle going on. And to some of you, it might be the first time you've heard that and think, this is a bit crazy. If your eyes are never open to the spiritual things, you will never understand spiritual warfare. You will never know how to battle. Teach us how to battle, Lord. And so I want to encourage you, church, to read your Bibles, to start looking at spiritual things. Start looking at how to fight. But be careful of what you search on the internet. There's a whole lot of crazy stuff out there. Not everything that you read or everything that you watch is true. Don't take it as gospel. If it doesn't line up with the scripture, do not accept it. Do not accept it as a teacher. I, I don't care what people's experiences are out there. If it doesn't line up with scripture, don't accept it. If God wants to speak outside of scripture, of course he can. Of course he can. It doesn't talk about a microwave in the Bible, but we know microwaves are real. It doesn't talk about cars in the Bible, but we know cars are real and mobile phones. It says one day every eye will, will see the return. Everyone would see the return of Jesus. How is that possible? Well, the internet. But back then it made no sense. How would everyone see it? something that happened in Israel? How would we see here? It doesn't matter if it comes on the clouds. I can't see the clouds in Israel. How are we going to see? But it makes a little bit more sense as a potential. Potential, it's the internet. The potential, it's the news stations that would, would show this moment that every eye would see. There's so many things, so many things that we have to be aware of that aren't always written plainly black and white. But be careful when starting to study this. But I want your eyes to be open. And so I'm praying, God, open their eyes like Elisha, that, that he may see where Elisha prayed for his servant, that his servant may see the spiritual things. If we go too top heavy straight away, it could scare some people. If we go too top heavy straight away, it might mean, they sound like a crazy cult. I'm going to go with the messianic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like it could, the spiritual world is so real. It's so real. And so right here, I'm going to just go a little bit more spiritual. Principalities, verse 12, where it says about we fight and we fight against principalities. We're in a different area now. We're in a different area. There's a ranking. There's a ranking in the spiritual realm. If you're into spiritual things, you know spiritual things, this won't shake you in one moment. You'll understand totally away. So totally. But there is a ranking. I'm not going to try and do the Greek. I'm going I'm to skip the Greek due to time. But principalities. This ranking in, in the Greek speaks about a beginning, speaks about a power, speaks about a rule. It's kind of like a, a lesser ranking, if you like. And then it moves up. And then it says... And against the powers, and the powers were the royal authority, and it kind of manages domestic affairs and the rule of government. These are all the things that it means in the Greek. And as I was looking these things through, you could see like it was stepping up and stepping up and stepping up. Like you can deal with a stronghold in the name of Jesus, be done. It's gone. You move on. And then all of a sudden you come up against something and it's not shifting. It's not moving. Remember the enemy wants to take land and he wants to take territory. And it's not moving. And the Bible says in one part where they try to cast a demon out of someone. This sort comes out only by prayer and fasting. And that's why we need to learn how to pray. That's why we need to learn how to fast. That's why when you hear the trumpet call, come quick church. 
We must run together. One with a sword in our hand, the word of God, and another with a trowel, our working, our working hands. We must come together as one. The third thing, Cosmos, the rulers of darkness. The rulers of darkness, it's kind of like went to the next level, the Lord of the world, the devil and his demons. And then you get the final spiritual wickedness. He talks about a total depravity and inequity and malice and evil and des an evil desire. It's like the sickest of the sick. It's like it's kind of going up another level. Like you can't live a certain way in your life and then try and take on the demon of all demons. It's literally going to beat you up. The seven sons of Sceva. Remember, they tried to cast out a demon out of someone in the book of Acts. And the demon turned around and said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but you, who are you? And then the demon turns around and beats them up. And they run out naked and scared. Spiritual stuff is real. And if you mess around with the wrong spiritual stuff, you open up a whole new doorway. If you mess about with the spiritualist things, the Ouija boards and all those kind of things, if you're into drugs, if you're looking, to, well, forget the sorcery, but anyway, if you, if you mess around with drugs and, and other things, you start to open up a door to another world. You start to open up a door and the enemy wants to pull you down. I don't want to sound like a crazy man today, especially if you've never been to church before. But it's just the truth. But I know the answer. I know the one that can put you on the straight path. His name's Jesus. Amen. Very, very quickly, because I went six minutes over, and I didn't want to read the book of Daniel. Read the book of Daniel. He prays. He fasts. There's a battle going on. He prays. He fasts. Then we find that the angel manages to come down with a word. Okay? And he says... God says, I heard the word on the first day. I heard your prayer on day one. But when I was sending the message back, if you like, as the angel was coming down, somewhere in the middle, spiritual warfare, there's a fight going on over this nation. There's a fight going on over this church. As the angel came back with the message, Prince of Persia stood up. Oh, one of these bigger demons of that area, because they like to take land. They like to take um, territory. A fight ensued, and for 21 days, it took until he broke through. How did he break through? 21 days of fasting was happening here on the earth. Some of it was happening in the physical, which affected the spiritual. That's what takes place, church. And so we need a Bible study these things. You can't just have a 40-minute talk and like you've got it all together because there's so many questions, so many answers. We need a Bible study of these things. We need to talk about these things. We need to start looking into it. My job today was to start to get you to open the page of the Bible and start looking with spiritual eyes. Start to think about the spiritual things. And yet at the same time, I came for anybody today that doesn't know Jesus. If some things have gone over your head... Don't worry about it. You weren't meant to know everything on day one. There's not a Christian in this room that knows everything. There's not a man at the front of any church that knows everything. We're learning as we go. Not everything that I say you agree with. Don't hate me for it. Don't, don't throw everything away. Because there's going to be good in there that God wants to use for you. And so what I want to say to you today. Christian, I talk about the spiritual things. I'm just wetting your appetite, we need to go much deeper in this, I'm just wetting your appetite and start to think, start to look, and yet don't be crazy you've got to have a balance you've got to have a balance this is the dangers of talking spiritual things that we can spiritualise everything, I trip over the devil just tripped me over, you nasty devil no, the devil didn't trip you over your shoelaces are untied it's those kind of things don't be crazy, but don't be like I used to be. That was nothing. Don't be that. Don't be that. Find the balance somewhere. You will make mistakes and you'll get some things right. Stay close to the word of God and we won't go far off. If there's anybody in this room today that doesn't know Jesus, but you know that you need to change your life. I've mentioned it a few times today. You know me. I mention it quite a lot because Jesus saved me and I'm... I always have to give him the glory. But I used to be an addict. I used to never want to live. I had my whole life going the wrong direction. And I came to a place one day when I said, 
I can do it no more. I need to exchange my old life for a new life. And you see, there's only one God. His name's Jesus. I know there's a confusing world out there, but there's only one God who came and paid the price for us because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He paid the price and he said, I want to take that sin that you do and I want to take the punishment for you and I want to now give to you what we call grace. And grace covers your sin that God says, now, come follow me. There's a word called repentance. Repentance is more than just saying sorry. Repentance is saying, God, I'm sorry I've made mistakes. I want to exchange my old life for a new life. And so now I look to you. And then he's saying, come follow me and go follow him. He says, come just as you are. He doesn't say change everything and then come. He says, come just as you are. If there's anybody in this room today that says, that's me. I need to exchange my old life for a new life. I need to follow this Jesus that you talk about. If only you knew what was going on in my life. What Jesus does. And I promise you, if you give over to him today, it's the best decision that you've ever made. If there's anybody in this room today that says, that's me. While every head is bowed and every eye closed. If you just raise your hand, if you say, today, I want to give my life to Jesus. It's between just me, you and God right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's anybody that says, that's me, I'm just going to quickly look around the room. If there's anyone that says, that's me, I want to give my life to Jesus, would you just raise your hand right now? I just want to quickly pray for you. Bless you, my brother. Bless you, my brother. <laughs> just to make sure, because I saw two guys place their hands in the air and I don't know everybody in this room and sometimes we, we just think we know and we just think oh there's a Christian there's not if there's anybody else in this room that's saying that's me I want to give my life to Jesus if your hands in the air right now I'm going to presume you give me your life to Jesus so bless you my sister <laughs>